Hi, we're Magic Behaviour Management. I'm Katie Lamarb. And I'm Marie Gentles, and we're both co-founders of Magic Behaviour Management Limited. Uh, Magic Behaviour Management is a training and consultancy business that supports children and young people with emotional and behavioural difficulties. So for the Early Years Festival today, we're going to be looking at the following objectives. To understand the importance of physical and emotional containment, that behaviour is a language of communication and the need for secure attachments when working with children. And finally, to learn new strategies that can be used in your home or your setting. Now, so often when working with children and young people, we're asked by the adults supporting them, tell us what strategies we need to use. And we always get there. But first we say, we need to think about the ABC. So at Magic Behaviour Management, we've created the ABC box. Now, A stands for attachment, B is understanding behaviour as a language of communication, and C is around containment. Now, we'll look at all three segments today, and we will start with containment. We always start with containment first. So let's have a look at what containment means. Containment is where a person receives and understands the emotional communication of another without being overwhelmed by it and communicates this back to the other person. This process can restore the ability to think in the other person. Absolutely. So when thinking about containment, it's about how a young person is able to feel emotionally secure and contained. We can think of containment in two parts, physical containment and emotional containment. On the surface, physical containment, having a hug, being physically near to reassure, and emotional containment, listening and being able to take things on. Having a physical containment is not just physical touch, but it's also about the space we're in. Sometimes, especially for very young children, a big space, a vast space, doesn't feel safe and contained. So we have to think about how we can organise that space and make it a more contained environment for them. It could be physically holding them, a cuddle, having them sitting next to you, being down on the floor with them, but about securing that physical space, thinking about how their behavior is reflective in the space. Are they throwing things? Are they figuratively bouncing off the walls? What is it that about that space that they physically do not feel secure? And how can we as the adults, the containers secure that for them? Emotional containment, being able to listen to and understand another person's problems. The key with emotional containment is for you, the container, the adult, to not become overwhelmed. If a child comes to you and they're upset, something's troubling them, however they're communicating this emotionally to you, we as the container need to be able to listen to that, take it on without becoming overwhelmed. Especially with you are young children, this means that we have to show that it's not making us stressed and we're not getting angry and aggravated by it, but that we're able to help them deal with that problem, deal with the emotions and help them solve it and move on, giving, them, giving that child or young person your attention, your understanding, and ultimately creating the ability for them not to feel overwhelmed. Absolutely. And it's important to remember here that in an adult to adult relationship, either or can be the container. With an adult and child relationship, the adult always needs to be the container. Now, if we think we have a glass analogy here. So if we think about um, a young person who before they even go to their nursery setting or their school setting, and we think about all of those things that could already be emotionally filling them up. So we often assume that once a child has had a night's rest, when they wake up, they are fresh and ready to go to their, their setting. But often this is not the case. Often children with emotional and behavioral issues will go to bed with such feelings of anxiety, trauma, anger, fear, etc., and will wake up already feeling full. So if we picture it with this glass, if they're coming into your setting already 90% full of such feelings as these on the screen here, then when you're then asking them, uh, maybe, can you please use kind hands and hang your coat up sensibly? They only have 10% capacity to think and reason and make sensible decisions. 
And this is why it's important to think about what we can't see and think about what's behind the behavior and what the young people are carrying with them each and every day. Especially with young children of nursery age or younger, when they're full up, it really comes out in their behavior. And we'll move on to behavior as communication, but we must remember to separate the child from the behavior. When we see little stamping feet, or what we like to call a tantrum, it's when they're really full. We have to recognize that they'll need space to defill and that we, as Marie said, as the containers need to be ready to emotionally take that on for them, show that it's not a burden and provide the physical containment in that space. Even thinking about your stature and your stance, the tone of your voice and the look on your face, the younger the child, the more they will read your expression. If they've come in and they haven't wanted to separate from mum and dad at the door, think about those two parts of the containment. What are we asking of them? As Marie said, are we asking them just to hang up their coat or are we asking them to take off their coat, change their wellies into their school shoes, come into the room, sit on the carpet? Let's think about how we're containing them. Take your time, take the burden off that they didn't want to leave mum and dad, give them a simple instruction, ensure that as they move into the physical space, they're feeling contained, and then we can start to give more instruction. Absolutely. And maybe start now thinking when you see your, your young person that you're, you're caring for, looking at them and start using the language of your colleagues. I think they're a bit full. Do they look full? Or sometimes even with ourselves, do I feel full or a colleague noticing, are you full? Because mm -hmm. if you are, just remember, the fuller you are, the less capacity you have to reason. It's a scientific fact in the way our brains work. So it goes both ways with both the young people and ourselves in order to be the container for them. So we've come back to the ABC box. We have briefly had a look at containment and now we're going to be moving on to attachments. Okay, so let's have a look at attachment. So attachments are about the relationship that forms between a child and their primary carer, even before the, the young baby is born. Now, of course, this develops over time through their developing relationship. And um, it's really important because it dictates the way that they feel about themselves in regards to their own identity and how they view the world. Now, there's four different attachment styles. There's varying various words for them, but generally there's one secure attachment style, which is the secure attachment. And that uh, describes the attachment style between a young person and their primary carer that has been um, developed and nurtured in a way that when the young person is born, they already feel emotionally secure in the presence and in the care of their primary carer. The Ultimately, that's them knowing the parents coming back, isn't it, Marie? Yeah, Especially absolutely. with younger children. Absolutely. The other three attachment styles are insecure attachment styles. And as we go up the scale, if you like, all the way up until disorganized, they vary um, in different respects in regards to how the child views the world. So as Katie's just said, if you're secure, if you feel secure and the child has a secure attachment style, uh, uh, style with you, then what will often happen is they, things like if you've left them at the door or if a parent has left them at the door, they know that parent's coming back. They might cry for a bit, but then they can settle and attach to the caregivers within the setting. Children and young people with an insecure attachment style may find that a bit more difficult. They may have had experience in the past of an adult who doesn't return straight away, or if they've cried or if they're distressed, haven't met their primary needs. We have a longer training uh, centered around attachment. And if you're recognizing some of what we're saying in the children in your home or setting, then you can look on our website or contact us for further information. Okay, so here we've got why attachment is important. And attachment is important, as we've said before, because it will determine the way the young child views the world. So it, it determines the attitudes they have, their beliefs and their values, how they resolve conflict. So if we think about their peer groups and their relationships with other people and how they resolve things, that's all to do with their attachment style, their ability to trust, that's a very, very big one, their self-image, 
their level of independence, their sense of stability and safety, their emotional safety, again, going back to containment and just how they view the world. Is the world a safe space for me to be in? Or is the world a scary place where I can't trust anybody and it makes me feel funny inside? And again, that also links to um, containment as well. Mm -hmm. A perfect example from this wheel of some of the younger children that you may work with in your home and setting would be a conflict resolution skill. Children with secure attachments are able to navigate this. There will always be incidences where we want or don't want to share things. And when they are very young, they have to navigate through this and learn how to communicate with others and respond to things that they do or they don't like. Children with secure attachment styles will find these scenarios easier than their peers who have insecure attachments. So whether they are snatching or being snatched from, the way they react in those situations and how the conflict is then resolved independently by themselves will be very much dependent on how secure their attachments have been from birth. So we're back to the containment box for the third and last time for our final section, behavior as communication. Okay, so everyone communicates with their behaviour, us included, and this is really important to reflect upon because children and young people with emotional and behavioural difficulties, especially those with an insecure attachment style, will often be reading and looking at your behaviour as the adult, and they'll be reading into that, can you keep me safe? If you're anxious, then that makes me feel more anxious. If they can identify, hold on a moment, my adult, my, my caregiver doesn't seem as they usually are. They seem more upset today or whatever it may be. That can unsettle them. This is why it's so important to understand and look after yourselves before we look after the young people. Now, we always talk about understanding behavior as a language of communication. So when we see a young person's behavior, instead of looking just at the behavior, and often what we see is this is the behavior. So this is the sanction that needs to do go with it. And what we also need to do, however, in addition, is look behind the behavior. What is the behavior communicating? Now, often children will display very big and sometimes very scary looking behaviors, even the very, very young children. But this is because they are communicating something to us. Am I distressed? Are they distressed? Are they anxious? Are they worried? Are they fearful? There is always something that they're communicating to us through their behaviour. Often so when children are very young, language can come into play. So it's that they just don't have the words to express what they want. So as Marie said, you, it's being communicated through their behaviour in a different way if they are continuously pushing other children, it could be that they just don't have the language skills to be able to say, I want to play. That's a real simplistic view of behavior as communication. Absolutely, and this is why we, our role, is to explore how to best manage and support them. And talking to colleagues, et cetera, is that one of the best ways to do it. Now it can be distressing and it can affect you if you are dealing with a young person with very high level behaviors. But what we need to remember here, just think of that glass. When you're looking at the behavior, instead of looking just at, whoa, that makes me feel very uncomfortable, try turning it around and now thinking, how full are they? They're really full. What are they full of? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it worry? And that's then looking at the behavior as a language of communication. Once we're able to do that, it then changes our stance on it. It then doesn't seem so fearful and scary to us. And we can then also see clearly to work out the best course of action to support the young person. So it's very, very important that one thing if you're gonna go away with today is just thinking behavior as a language of communication. What is the behavior telling me? And finally, for our final objective, we're going to look at something we've created called the containment puzzle. And from there, we're going to provide you with some strategies that you can use in your home or your setting. OK, so there's seven pieces to this puzzle. Now, what we say at Magic Behaviour Management is that each piece of the puzzle needs to be equally weighted and in play in order to achieve 
behavior modification, and then for it to be sustained over time. So very often we've done work with families in different settings and it's all going absolutely swimmingly. And then a couple of months later, we may be contacted and they'll say, oh, we don't know what's happened. And the first thing we do is go back to the containment puzzle. And very often, in fact, pretty much all the time, what's happened is one of the puzzle pieces has slipped. So for example, we were in a school recently and they were doing things absolutely fantastically, but the boundaries had started to shift. So where before they were very tight and extremely consistent, the boundaries began to shift with the child's behavior. So it started to become, okay, well, if you do that one more time, then you're going to get this consequence. And then it was just one more time. And then it continued in that vein. Whereas if we're saying to a young person, if you do that one more time, this is what will happen, then that's what needs to happen. Because underpinning this containment puzzle is consistency. That is the key. That's the magic for, for to help it work, to make it work. Now we're going to focus on just one of these puzzle pieces to give you some strategies today. And that piece is language. Language is key for all children and young people, but at Magic Behaviour Management, we feel the best intervention is early intervention. So for early years settings, these four strategies can be a really successful tool in successfully man managing behaviour over time. So Marie, for the first one, thank you, not please, over to you. <laughs> Absolutely. So this is so, so simple. This is something you can literally start using as soon as you come away from here. And when we're asking a child to do or not to do something, we often say, um, please sit on your chair properly or sit on your chair properly, please. And that's very, very common. And it doesn't mean we've done anything wrong, but now we're starting to think about things in a slightly different way. Now, when we say the word please at the end, it's, it's often um, uh, we're, we're asking them to, to do something, of course, but then we're giving them a little bit of room to say, mm, shall I do it or shall I not? When we say thank you, it becomes an expectation. So please is a request and thank you becomes an expectation. And as soon as we change that language, it just gives the young person less brain space, if you like, less time, less take up time to think to us their set themselves, shall I do this or shall I not? So simple as sit on that chair properly, thank you. Instead of sit on that chair properly, please. So simple, but so powerful and so effective. And we probably get the most positive feedback from this strategy. Absolutely. Another way of finding if this is really working in your home or setting is when, especially with very young children, the more consistently you use thank you, not please, you'll start to hear your children and young people using it themselves in their role play or with their friends and peers. So when they're talking to siblings or friends or peers in your setting and they say, put your shoes on, thank you, you know that this one's really embedded. <laughs> I'm going to talk about the language of choice. Now, Marie and I use the language of choice right up to working with teenagers. Language of choice means that things are limited and more secure. When we think about containment at the very beginning, when we were thinking of the emotional and physical side of things, language of choice really does that through a verbal approach. With much younger children, when we give them too many choices, it makes it almost impossible, just like the cup when they're very full up, to make the right choice. So as the container, the adults, it's up to us to limit that for them, providing them with two choices. Two choices means it's much easier to make a decision. And as the adult, we remain in control. Those choices have got to be both an outcome that you want. So when you're giving it to the child, they feel like they're in control. I get the choice, but what Ever they choose has the outcome that you wanted. And I cannot stress enough how impactful this is in within, within emotional containment. This really does help young children and young people to feel emotionally contained. Very important. But like Katie said, they must be what you want the outcome to be. Okay, let's move on to labeling feelings. So very often with young children, we, uh, when we're very busy and we've got lots of young children to, to manage and deal with, we can often say to them um, subconsciously, no, stop doing that. You're, you're, you're being naughty at the moment or whatever it may be. Now, what we need to think about is from a very young age, 
starting to support the children to be able to label their feelings so they don't feel that they become the feeling. So often we'll hear children um, voicing back to us, but I just do that because I'm naughty or when I'm being naughty, this is what I do. And they become the, the, the word. So they feel that they're the naughty child. And we say, no, you're not the naughty child. The behavior we don't like, but you are an amazing child. So it's very important we start to say to them, I, th I think that you're feeling a little bit sad at the moment. And that's why you've made this choice, whatever it may be. And being very clear that it's okay to feel sad. That's not what you're upset about. But what's not okay is the action that they've chosen because they feel sad. So I cannot stress this enough. This is very impactful from a very young age, right through to young adults, I would actually say, with emotional and behavioral difficulties. And to second what Marie said, once you've started labeling the child's feelings, when they then start labeling their feelings, ensure that you cement that. So when they say, I'm feeling angry, if you know that's the correct label, then confirm that. I can see you're feeling angry. That's when again, just like with thank you, not please, you start to see that that's really becoming embedded. And it's giving them those tools and those language that as they progress and get older and move into primary and then into juniors and secondary, that that language, that core understanding of their emotions is there and that you've given them the clarification that that's correct. That is the correct emotion for that feeling. Absolutely, absolutely. Finally, we have praise after instruction. One of our particular favorites, especially with much younger children. With much younger children, it can often feel that we're constantly giving them instructions. Put that down, don't sit there, come and sit here, get your coat on, hurry up. There's a lot of information to give them. But when we've given a child an instruction, what can often happen is we forget to then praise the fact they've done it. So if we're saying, come and put your shoes on and you've had to give a warning, once that task has been completed, ensure that you put praise in immediately afterwards. I knew you could put your shoes on by yourself. Fantastic, you're the first one ready. If you want the children to come and clear something away, if they are the first child to get there, but previously they've been the one that had taken ages to come and clear up, praise after instruction, look, Billy's already helping us tidy up. Fantastic. I love the way you're clearing away. The praise after an instruction creates a feeling in the child. That feels good. And that way, the more instructions you give, the quicker response you'll see to things because they want that feeling again. Absolutely. And I'll just only add to that, just keep it very specific. So as Katie said, not just well done, I'm really proud of you or whatever it may be, being very specific, well done for the way you put those things away as I've asked you to, so they know exactly what to do to recreate that feeling, to recreate that moment of praise and that feeling it gave them. These are four really simple strategies, some of which you might have heard and thought, but I'm already doing this. So our final note is to remind you of the containment puzzle that we showed you previously. Absolutely every strategy or piece of advice that we give will only work for a sustained period if it is used consistently. Consistency is key for all of the strategies we've given you. We now welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you.